The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Okay, lots to talk about. Uh, last time we got to the point where we put together Power Zone 2, but we hadn't actually tried it. So <laughs> let's take a look and see what it is, and then we'll talk about some stuff. Uh, um, this is our two power zones. Uh, can you, uh, the gray up here, yeah, you might be able to see it. That's, uh, this is Power Zone 1, the original one. Uh, uh, and right here is the DOs, the data only intertile connectors that uh, share ground wires and signaling wires but no power. So the idea is we should be able to power zone one up, leave zone two cold and bring it up separately. Let's try it. Uh, uh, I've had some issues but here we go. All right. So that's going to take a, a minute and a half still, how frustrating, uh, to come up. But the point is, uh, let's get this guy ready to rock. Uh, hey, power zone one. Uh, um, all right, uh, uh, to actually get the screen, then it turns, it's a matter of turning off the lights and, and letting this stuff show through. Uh, um, actually, why don't we do that now? Um, and so we could try to see some stuff happening and then we'll boot up these other ones and we'll call it a day. It's plenty dark. Uh, let's put in a few. Get a few beans running around there. And now, actually, what the heck, let's get. So C2 is the splits at the end of the universe, guys. So uh, if we give them some time, which I'm not going to do right now, um, they'd start to fill things up. Modulo, the continuing bugs. All right, so here we go. Let's power up uh, zone two. All right, so power zoom two comes up, and we see the frontier between them as the intertile connectors negotiate and and manage to figure out uh, and get in sync with each other, happening all over here, and happening between power zone one and power zone two. So now, there we go, there we go, okay. So now, all across the frontier, uh, the intertile connectors have opened up, and we ought to, for example, be able to send a C2 right through from power zone two into power zone one, and so forth. So that's the, that's the good news, um, and let's just go back and talk about it a little bit. So, lots of issues. Uh, let's see where to begin. 
So this is what it looked like when I was putting it together. Sharp eyes will notice that the new Parazone 2 is on the left in this picture, where it was on the right in the video. I rebuilt it a couple of times, but this is just to show you what it looks like. Uh, there are the back plastic frames that connect to the overhooks, and then they connect to each other. These are pos male and female uh, overlap and squeeze together. They're just press fit, but they're, I did them pretty tight, and they really seem to be mm, pretty reliable, pretty... I mean, partly, you don't want them to be incredibly strong. <laughs> Actually, they, they need to give a little bit so that everything else can shift into place. And in general, it's kind of like crush zones. Uh, you want to uh, let them uh, absorb some of the energy, so clicking it in all the way down the line. Then you put a tile in to cover them, and then you just need a, a DO connector on one side or the other, well, all the way around, to avoid making a single electrical path between the two power zones, which could destroy the power supplies, which is one of the reasons to really avoid this. And way back in 2008, with the first generation, the Illuminato X Machina, when I was teaching with them, students often, uh, well, more than zero times destroyed power supplies and could have had bigger problems by connecting multiple power supplies through uh, a bunch of T1 tiles that were actually, uh, shouldn't be connected together. Uh, uh, and so here it is. So here's the, the uh, two of them, uh, almost all of them in. And it immediately brings up another problem, which is the content data manager uh, that we worked on ages ago, and it's really just been doing its job okay, is is conservative. And what it does is it, it, sent, it has an MFZ file, which is like a jar, like a zip, uh, cryptographically signed by the key master so that there's some reason for these... Uh, uh, these tiles to trust this particular new code because this is low level code. This is laws of physics code that comes in in the MFZ file. So if you change the MFZ files, you're performing magic. You're changing the laws of physics. And so that's where we put in the cryptography and all that stuff. At the upper level, at the atoms and the elements and so forth, that's where we want the custom bespoke reality to fend for itself and it's not about cryptography it's not about uh, uh, fragile brittle systems and so forth the problem is is cdm uh, going through these intertile connectors is slow and we want to reserve most of the bandwidth for the upper level for the mfm events so in fact to send the mfm package which is big especially because at the moment i've compiled it with all kinds of debugging options which makes it bigger it's like a 15 megabyte file which doesn't sound like much but it actually takes over two hours, like two and a half hours, to go one hop. So if we're going, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hops to get across two power zones, times two and a half hours, that's a pretty slow workflow. So uh, I spent most of the time uh, this past two weeks working on a new version of the Common Data Manager CDM, the pipelined version of it, so that rather than have the destination wait to receive the entire file so that it can verify the checksum and the signature before it sends it on further, which is the safest thing to do, now I'm having the origin compute a bunch of intermediate checksums at like 1%, 2%, 3% of the file and pass them along and empower the receiver once they get to a checksum match, they can then announce that much of the file downstream. So if we can get this to work right, we might be able to go across a relatively large grid in not that much more than it would take to do one hop. That's the power of pipelining. And in my little test, um, you know, so, all right, so we have a new version of T212. That's the package that has all the infrastructure in it, everything but MFM. Uh, and that's where the Common Data Manager is. So we're using the old version of the Common Data Manager to release the new version of it. And that's a little tricky. That's like rebuilding an airplane while you're flying it. And I, I try really hard uh, uh, and some parts of it worked but so when we're updating t212 we're using the old one hop at a time uh, thing and that's the sent starting to send to sending last of that's the hallmark of the old style uh, and and this guy got it and he installed it and he all of a sudden knows about running version one there only was version one before nobody ever said it that's because he's now running the new version 
and he gets back in touch with the key master now oh and the down and up shows that in fact the guy that to our northeast the key master's northeast actually rebooted after installing the t212 package now he's running version two uh, um and on my desk you know so here's the key master at the bottom and the guy that we just saw at the beginning and another guy up at the top and you can see uh, bulk data moving through all, all the connectors at once that's the pipeline working uh, um, and so yellow is the guy that's at the top he received the the t212 package he installed it and now he's announcing it uh, oh and now that he's getting a new version of the MFM package actually MFM 2 I just made it up for testing uh, but these prefix extended those are the hallmarks of the pipeline where every time we get a new checksum for so much we then announce to the rest of the world that I have this far if you don't have this as far I can give you pieces of it so that all worked pretty well and it's all ends up hanging on how do you know which two t212 you want which mfm t2 you want uh, um, and there's a, a little pink uh, box at the bottom of the tile display that uh, probably can't see very often because it's really a tiny font but it's got these numbers these are not serial numbers these are unix time numbers seconds since 1970 something like that and within a name t212 we just believe a cryptographic signed timestamp that's newer than the one that we've got means we should take it a cryptographically signed MFM T2 that's newer and so forth uh, uh, so we can watch this we can see it happening uh, uh, so here uh, five, five not four forty eighty forty eight eighty four I, I usually look at the low order digits because they're kind of rare that's the old version um, and here oh, look at this so up here uh, oh, he's got the new version too, uh, 5484, but his MFM T2 is the 32526. And these guys up here uh, have a different 94562. And in fact, all three guys around him have the newer version of MFM. And this guy is downloading uh, the MFM package from all three of them at once. Uh, and it's not quite BitTorrent because, well, for one thing, we, we do it sequentially from the front. And for another thing, uh, we don't go three times faster because we're trying not to kill the tile and leave some performance over. So it doesn't actually speed it all that much up, but it makes it more uh, resilient, uh, balances the load better. So that's the good news about the pipeline. Uh, uh, the bad news <laughs> is uh, once we take it out of the nice three little three guys in a row, uh, uh, it's got bugs. It's got bugs that are causing it to, to make not sufficient progress to actually hop across the thing. So more work needs to be done on that. Uh, okay. Also, there were hardware issues, and, and we're going to go a little bit long today, but there's been a lot of stuff going on, and, you know, what can I say? Uh, <laughs> this is the news. Uh, um, so what's wrong with this picture? Uh, uh, if we know anything about the uh, T2, the tile panel, which is what we're looking at here, uh, uh, that has a bunch of, of, of powerful things like reboot, turn yourself off, uh, uh, crash the engine, quit the engine, similar but different, and over here, a whole bunch of physical stats. 11.72 volts, that's the grid voltage that our entire power zone is seeing. 98.4, uh, 94.8 degrees is the temperature sensor in the middle of the circuit board. Minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit is allegedly the temperature at the edge of the board. So there's two temperature sensors on the circuit board. Unfortunately, the temperature sensors built into the CPU of our particular unit don't work that well. So so we're doing it indirectly by having these temperature sensitive resistors mounted nearby. This one I've been seeing forever. It was like a manufacturing defect or something like that. Uh, uh, it, these are the kind of things that happen if the board got flexed or so the solder cracked a little bit or something and so the temperature sensor is not making good contact. Uh, this one I was totally familiar with but however uh, in the past two weeks I ran into this one where both the center and the edge temperature were off and that was bad. The edge temperature we're not currently using for anything, but the center temperature we will actually start slowing down. This 1000M, that's the 1 gigahertz clock speed that the CPU is running at. And according, if the center temperature gets too high, uh, we actually throttle down the CPU to lower speeds to try to cool things off. It doesn't make all that much difference, but we try. So the fact that this thing is reading minus 95 uh, degrees, it's going to be perfectly happy running at 1 gigahertz, which is the max speed for these things. Uh, 
uh, no matter what's going on uh, under the hood. So that I am just living with at this point. Uh, I suspect I could, uh, you know, get down to the circuit board here and probably just touch the uh, contacts with the soldering iron and maybe fix this up, but it just hasn't risen to the level of putting the time in for it. On the other hand, uh, I had a tile that would not listen to me. I would type on it, uh, tap on it to bring up the uh, menu display. It would not bring up the menu display. I finally did debug that, and it's uh, it, it's uh, the touchscreen is, is dead. Um, and it, it, the touchscreen was not originally dead. It originally worked for some time, but somewhere along the way, it has died. This is what hardware does. So I marked it out. I pulled it out. I went back to the spreadsheet where we have the processing unit and the display uh, for each thing and marked out, you know, 3182, uh, rest in peace, and it got replaced with 3181 because that's one of the ones I just had lying around. So step by step. In addition, uh, uh, this tile was persistently running hot uh, so it was stopping down the speed all the way down to like 300 megahertz and so i uh which in fact when you when i have the the splits at the end of the universe running you can see this guy was becoming a a jamming place the the <laughs> they were all clogging up in the, in the middle of nowhere, and I was going, well, what's going on here? Well, it was like this guy was running 300 megahertz while all the tiles around him were running uh, at 1 gigahertz. So I took a look, and this was one that I had built early, and it didn't have uh, a heat sink in it. So I opened it up, and this was a chance, especially for folks that have come to the T2 tile relatively recently, might not have ever actually seen close up what it looks inside. This green board is the Seed uh, Studios Beetlebone Green. Uh, a particular version of this beagle bone which uses a texas instruments processor uh there it is uh here's the circuit board that, that we designed for the project uh, uh and one of those things right there uh th1 that is the temperature sensor uh, um for that's the center temperature sensor there so that gives you a sense of how big it is and, and where it's located so when you put the thing down below it uh, uh when you flip the uh, beagle bone green over and put it on there's still a gap but it's fairly close it's sensing the thing and in fact there's just enough of a gap that I found these little heat sinks, these little stick-on heat sinks that I have now been using when I do all the assemblies. So when I built the, uh, the uh, Power Zone 2 a couple of weeks ago, they all got the uh, heat sinks on it. Well, now this guy's got a heat sink on it as well. Board goes back on. You have to really push to get 96 pins to set. Um, and then I put these screws in. You know, it's not like the, the, this board is going to vibrate out of 96 pins, but Step by step, just be careful. Uh, put the screen back on, put it back in the case that we've seen plenty of, uh, and then plug it into the hole in the grid where it came out of, and put in the, in this case, uh, PD connectors, power and data, plus one PI, the power injector one. Okay. Uh, uh, one additional thing, we're going to take our 20 minutes. It's like the good old days. Uh, um, I had all of a sudden power zone 2 flashed and would not come up and it looked like the power supply had died i had made a new power supply put a new thing on it um, from uh to try it out because i was having i needed two power zones on the two power supplies for the grid and i had a third one for my own little guys uh this was a y splitter that i had made so that would be two options so that from a single power supply you could plug into a single power zone in two places well why do you want to do that well that's because you know just like we saw if you want to remove a tile that's got the one and only power injector on it you're going to have to put the uh, turn down the whole power zone in order to get at it. Whereas if you're plugged in in two places, you can always unplug one of them to get at a guy. So that's why I'm going to be using Y splitters on each power supply so that each power zone has two landing points for power from the power supply. This was one of them. Uh, it seemed like it was okay. Got closer. No, look at that. 
a uh, little bit of wire, a little loop of wire kind of coming easy so they kind of work around. It was shorting out the power supply and the power supply, thank you very much, was detecting it and cutting the circuitry. So nothing in fact was damaged uh, uh, and I uh, 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 and so I did a, uh, I, I did a new, uh, uh, I redid that uh, much more carefully. I think it's pretty good at this point. And then I went shopping <laughs> uh, uh, to find uh, one to two ma appropriate male to female splitters. Well, one challenge is most of these splitters are limited to three amps of current, and I'd prefer to have five amps, so that's why I was making my own. We'll see what happens going in. One interesting thing, uh, while I was shopping, I was also look, reading uh, this book, uh, called Systemantics, which is, it, it's kind of a, a corny book uh, about uh, uh, systems, but it's got a lot of really fundamental truth in it as well. Uh, um, any large system is going to be operating most of the time in failure mode. Yeah, well, that resonated for me <laughs> these last few weeks. Uh, uh, oh, and another one of its little pieces of evidence, applied systemantics. Uh, uh, loose systems last longer and function better. That's kind of the whole slogan for best effort computing for, for what we're actually trying to do here so that was nice to come across all right that's the hardware story uh, uh the few the proud the lcf nerds thank you folks uh martin from france is our latest uh lcf nerd also i just want to shout out again to isaac and andrew because they're actually doing monthly uh contributions and i see it every month when it comes and it's like oh no you know what have i done uh, uh so uh thank you uh, thank you folks so much uh, um step by step hmm, uh next week got to get the pipelining working and uh use the pipelining with the improved debugging to get back to intertile events. <sighs> That's it. I'm going to say sorry I ran so long, but I'm not going to say that. There was just a lot of stuff to talk about. I hope to see you next time. I hope you're doing okay. Have a good two weeks.